Hello, everybody, and welcome to my channel. You've reached another episode of Inmate to Roommate. We are up to episode five. Let's get right into this recap. The name of this episode is You Turn Your Back on Us, and let's just get right into it. We start the show with Kathy and Daniel. The producers visit them. Kathy reveals that Devin was recently arrested for having illegal. He was in a good mood, Kathy said. They were eating, they were getting along and everything. All of a sudden, his phone went off. He was checking the phone and then suddenly said that he had to leave. And Kathy said that they didn't hear from him after that. So Kathy is disappointed. She said that she had high hopes for Devin after he was released from prison. The producers ask Daniel and Kathy if they're going to bail Devin out. And they both say, absolutely not. Okay, absolutely not. Devin calls, Daniel asks what happened, and Devin admits that he tried to manage his addiction without committing crimes. And Daniel said, but you did commit a crime. He said, yeah, I meant like stealing and stuff like that. And then Devin says he feels abandoned. Kathy insists they supported him. Kathy was pissed off because Devin was like, you turned your back on me. And Kathy is like, we do what we're supposed to do. We didn't tell you to go out there and get drunk. Basically, he brought that on himself. Devin gets upset. He's like, I'm in jail right now. I don't have time for this. He hung up. He hangs up the phone on them. Kathy's frustrated. And neither one of them know what to do next because they don't want to disappoint Devin's grandparents. Next, we have Jason and Emily. They are on their way to go get something to eat. Okay. She says that it feels awkward. She's feeling awkward. The whole situation is awkward, really. Jason is eager to explore the world free. Jason asks Emily if she's ever been to the casino and she's like, well, I never have money for the casino. And Jason's like, you know, I need to get to the casino and, you know, make some money or whatever. And Emily's like, why don't you just, I don't know, get a job, like, you know, work a regular job with a regular paycheck. Jason says he doesn't remember the last time he had a job. He doesn't know what a paycheck looks like. And he jokes about needing a sugar mama, which Emily, she makes a face. But anyway, Emily is un unimpressed and she says that Jason. Jason's very first impression was the worst first impression of anyone she's ever had in her damn life. Next, we are with Annalisa and Veda. Mark has been staying with them for two weeks, though he has been disrespectful and ungrateful. Freaking bastard. Annalisa says that he has been better lately. You know, the whole tension and situation in the house has been better. So Annalisa focuses on helping Mark find a job. So she gives him this mock interview and he gives crappy answers. Okay, little hood, hood answers. Keep in mind, that this young man was in jail for eight years. So when he went to jail, he was like a little, he was like a teenager. Okay. So he really is still like at that mentally, he's 17 years old, I swear. Annalisa says you would definitely fail that interview. And she suggests to Mark that he start with a place called Urban League. And Urban League is a place that's going to help him with job training and resumes and all of that. And Mark is okay with it, although he says he does not want to do, he says to us, that he doesn't want to do a nine to five, really, but he needs money. So, yeah. Now we're here with Jennifer and Cindy. Jennifer is helping Cindy go through her crap because she's a freaking hoarder and she has all this dusty crap. Listen, I saw how Cindy's house looks. I wouldn't want to touch anything in that damn house without a gas mask and some rubber gloves, okay? Cindy says she's been living with her over a week. Jennifer says that at this point, living with Cindy is pretty frustrating because Cindy wants her there all the time. She says she's trying to get her kids back. She's trying to look for a job. She has so many priorities and so many things on her to-do list and she feels trapped. She feels like Cindy thinks that Cindy should be her top priority. And Cindy thinks that she is more important than what Jennifer has to do. So Cindy says that it's been a little awkward and she thinks that she's rubbed Jennifer the wrong way because she has rules at her house probably, but that's the way things are around here. She's the boss, okay? Literally, this is what Cindy says. Cindy says she's the boss, okay? Cindy, not to be rude, but I kind of have an idea why your son doesn't want to talk to you. I'm really sorry, but I have a little bit of an idea of why your son doesn't want to freaking talk to you, okay? I don't really like your attitude at all. And you know what? You're doing a favor for somebody. You still want to remain humble because all this stuff can be taken from you at any minute and then you're going to need help. And you wouldn't want nobody treating you like this if you had nowhere to stay, Cindy. Anyway, I do not like that lady. So yeah, back what I was saying. Cindy says she's the boss, so Jennifer needs to buck up. Anyway, um, she's here with Jennifer going through all her, all her bull crap and claiming that she's going to throw things away, but she just really doesn't want to throw anything away. This lady's a mother freaking hoarder. I swear she is. And Jennifer says it's hard to help this lady 
declutter because she wants to keep everything. All right. And she says that this is a big fat waste of her time. At this rate, Jennifer says it's going to take them a long time to get through all of this. And they still have the basement to do. And this is what she's saying to Cindy. Cindy tells us that she's not going to cater to Jennifer. This is my house. Cindy, that's why you're lonely. That's why you're alone. I see. I see why you are alone. And I see why your son doesn't talk to you now and doesn't want your grandchild around you. I see why. Because this tendency that you have with Jennifer, this is not a new attitude. This is not a new behavior. I, and I can't pinpoint it. You guys can write it in the comment section. It's something about the way Cindy is speaking on Jennifer that I do not like. I do not like that she's like, I'm the boss. What I say goes, da, da, da. We understand this is your house, but you don't have to treat her like she's beneath you. I don't like that at all. So where was I? Um, Cindy says, I'm not going to cater to Jennifer. This is my house. Jennifer, she catered to me. Cindy, go to hell. Okay, please go to hell with uh, you know what on. All right, go to hell. Anyway, Cindy asks Jennifer to go down to the store and grab a few things. Jennifer leaves and heads to the store and in the car, the producer asks Jennifer if she's frustrated with the living situation. And Jennifer says that Cindy always asks her to run errands and she gets upset if she's out doing things that she needs to get taken care of. And Jennifer says that she's basically at Cindy's mercy. And so now she's in the car, hasn't even been in there that long from what I see. Could be, I could be wrong. And she's in here already texting Jennifer and saying, what's taking you so long? Where are you? Jennifer says this is Cindy's norm to do that. That's what she does. Jennifer says when she's gone, it's when will you be back? And Jennifer says she doesn't know how long that she's going to last at Cindy's. She says she hasn't felt this much anxiety in a long time and she doesn't like being controlled. And Jennifer says that she doesn't think this was the best idea to live with Cindy. She says she feels lost and I feel sad for her because she's sitting here freaking crying. And she's says that she feels lost and she says she feels more lost than she felt when she was actively in her addiction. This, this is the kind of stuff that sends people back to drugs. Cindy, I really can't stand your stupid ass. Anyway, we're back with Jason and Emily. They're off to go get some food to eat. They pull up at this fancy place. Jason says he just really wanted some old... He just honestly... I really think that Jason just wanted a diner. You could have just took him to a regular schmegler old American diner and he would have loved it. Jason says the restaurant Emily picked is more upper class than he would have liked. And Emily says that she thought Jason would have been happy not eating prison slop. Okay, she didn't say it like that, but I am. Ha. Huh. Anyway... Emily says, <laughs> Emily says to Jason, she wants to talk about three things that are important to her. She says the rent, she knows that he won't be getting, be able to get that right away. So that's fine. She says her pets, please make sure they don't get out because in North Minneapolis, she will not get them back if they get out. And the lastly, um, she doesn't want anyone at her house that she doesn't know. She's dealt with identity theft 13 years ago, and she just doesn't want to take a chance. Honestly, lady. Um, the last thing I would have done as a victim of identity theft is take in someone straight from prison who has been for identity theft. But, you know, I could just, I don't know. Maybe I have common sense and a lot of people don't. And a lot of people don't. Anyway, Jason says that he was in prison for 3.5 years and he want to get some you know what from a lady. Y'all know what I'm trying to say. Okay, don't make me get graphic. We, I try not to do that on this channel. Okay. Emily says, well, that's not my problem. That's really kind of not my problem. Okay. Jason says that he's got a bunch of pen pals that he has to pay back and he's not happy about the rule about no people at the house while she's not there. He says, <laughs> I have to laugh because it's funny. Jason says that he's been around hairy dudes for three and a half years and he just wants to feel the touch, the feel of a woman. That's what he wants. That's what he said. I'm just saying. And he really said that. I, I'm not making that up. He really said that. And Jason says that he's going to have to work around those uh, that situation. He's going to have to work on some negotiations regarding that rule. But he will most likely break that rule. And he says the last time he had intimacy with a woman was two hours before he was arrested three and a half years ago. Damn, it's been a mighty long time, brother man. So Emily says to Jason very randomly, look me in the eye and promise me that you're not going to have anyone in my house. House. And he looks at her and he says he won't. But we all know that he will. OK, because I mean, he's a liar. He's a Charlton. Come on now. Anyway, Emily says, remember, it's a deal breaker. And she says after talking to Jason that she's wondering if she's going to regret this whole situation. So Emily says she has to work tonight. She has to get home. And at that moment, Jason gets a phone call from Margarita. Margarita, why are you messing with Jason? Anyway, 
you know, I mean, I, I'm not going to call her any names. I just find it strange that, well, you'll see how she looks when she comes. She's not ugly. Anyway, Jason tells her that the lady that he's living with is not cool with people coming over. And he tells Margarita to come over after 8 p.m. Jason says, sure, he's worried about the consequences of getting caught with a girl in his room, but he ain't going to deny himself the chance to be with a woman. So next we have Marisol and Jimmy. And Marisol says the past weeks have been a nightmare dealing with Mickey's situation. They really have been getting the runaround and it's been very frustrating. And Jimmy says, we were trying to get him help and get him in a family environment. And now it's like they're down to the last straw. The first time they went to Meg's County Jail, they found out Mickey had new charges that they had no clue about. Marisol says to Jimmy that he was trying to manipulate the situation and had them believing that he was going to get out. And Jimmy says everyone else is saying he's using them to be able to get out and run because that's all he ever did. So Marisol and Jimmy go into the courthouse. A little longer than a few minutes later. The producer asks Jimmy and Marisol what's going on. Jimmy says Mickey has been sentenced to six years. He got 14 months in penitentiary. He was facing 24 years if he didn't accept this deal. Jimmy tries to talk to Mickey and he, the cop refuses as he's transporting him. So they meet Mickey in like a separate area in the courthouse to meet him, I guess. Um, I really don't know what the hell y'all have to talk to Mickey about, Jimmy. Like he's going to prison for six years. Ta-ta, toodly do smooches, see you later. I don't even know why y'all need to sit down with this guy. Y'all still willing, after six years when this man does his time, y'all still willing to take this man in. Alrighty then. So Kathy goes down to pick up Devin, and she says she actually really likes Devin, but he made her mad. And Kathy says that they promised Devin's grandparents to help Devin get back on his feet and that, you know, they would take him in. I still find that strange that the grandparents themselves aren't doing it. And she basically wants to see if they can make a decision as to whether he's going to stay at their house again. Veda is taking Mark to this Urban League. So Veda says the Urban League is willing to sit and talk to Mark about how they can get him a job and some life skills. Mark says on the way to Urban League, he feels like it's going to be a waste of time. He says he honestly couldn't care less. I'm saying it properly. Of course he didn't. Mark says this interview is probably going to be some more bogus crap that ain't going to add up to anything. Mark says that his roommate's been saying that this place has a lot to offer. And since he got out, he hasn't been offered anything. So Mark meets up with Josh, who has a similar criminal history to Mark. And Mark feels that he can actually, like, understand and have finally has somebody that, you know, understands what he's going through. So Josh says that before I break down the program, I've heard a lot about you, but I would like to hear from yourself. So tell me, what's your story? Mark Mark says he just got out of prison a couple weeks ago. He says that he was there almost eight years, so he's trying to change his life. Mark says he was 17 years old when he went in. That is so, so sad to me that he went in there at 17. He got out at about t- almost 25 or 25, and, you know, he really is behind. So Josh says that he was about the same age when he went to penitentiary. He was 18, and when he got out, he was about 27. Josh said that he's in his 40s, and he never went back. Josh says that when he looks at Mark, he sees himself. He says that he remembers getting out and being ready. And Josh says, but then there would be all these barriers. And Josh said, a lot of people don't understand. Mark says, I was a kid. I didn't have to do none of that. He got out, and when he got out, he was an adult. He doesn't know anything about a W-2, never had a bank account, none of that stuff. So Josh explains what this thing called Career Bridge does is teaches him basic life skills, basically. Mark says that he definitely feels like he can relate to Josh. He says that Josh knows where he's coming from, getting out, going in prison young and getting out an adult. Mark says it's good to have someone like that in your corner that understands where you're coming from. Mark gets in the car and he's talking to Veda and lets him know that Career Bridge at um, Urban League can get him paid training. And Veda's like, it don't get no better than that. Veda says that Mark makes statements that he doesn't get excited, but he's excited right now and I'm happy happy for him. Mark thanks Veda for bringing him up there, says that he appreciates it. Mark says that this is definitely the first time that he feels like things are finally coming in order. They finally got the ball rolling and that's what he needed. Veda tells Mark that he's really proud of him and he says that he knows this whole situation is pretty overwhelming. So Jennifer, we're back uh, with Cindy and Jennifer. Jennifer is here crying and saying she's sorry. Cindy says today Jennifer woke her up in a panic and she said that she needed to go to because she really 
Cindy says it has scared the hell out of her. She says that she's never experienced any of this before. And Cindy says that she doesn't know what to do. So the producer asks Jennifer, who else have you called? And Jennifer says, just you guys. Jennifer says she hasn't called her mom yet. She's going to be so disappointed in me. So the producer is really like comforting Jennifer. She's saying one step at a time. You're doing the right thing. You're getting help. You reached out. You reached out to the support system that you have. Jennifer says, I should have reached out before it even happened. Cindy says that she called her friend Angela over there because she thinks if Jennifer were to open in her house, she would be scared to death. So Angela's there and she's asking Jennifer, are you ready? And Jennifer says, where are, you, where are we going? And Angela says to the hospital, they will set us up from there. Jennifer says, I don't know what I'm doing right now. Cindy says, you're okay. You don't have to do anything, but you don't have to do anything but get in the car and just relax. Cindy says that she doesn't know if she's done the drug in her home. And she says that she doesn't want them in her house. It scares her so much. So we're back with Emily and Jason. She says, the plan is when we get to the house, I'll show you your room and then I got to go off to work. So Jason asks, what time do you usually work until? And Emily says she works until seven. Emily, you telling him the wrong thing. Emily says she's gone all night. Jason says he's not happy about the rule of not being able to have women over. So they reach the house and he says that it's just like the house that he used to live in. So Jason likes the house. He says that he likes the old wood and the furniture and stuff is very retro and he likes it. So Emily shows Jason his room and his room is kind of big. Damn. Jason says the house is great. He thought it was going to be a bit more worn down because of the dogs, but it seems to be in great shape. He says his room is more than he can ask for. So Jason gives Emily a hug and says how much he really appreciates this. Emily says that she hopes Jason has a positive outlook for coming there so that he can be successful and it can be a win-win situation for the both of them. She says that she can give him the tools, but it's up to him to do the work. And she hopes for the best. Jason says that he's so overwhelmed and thank you doesn't seem like enough. Emily says that they'll talk more tomorrow, but she has to go to work. And Jason says, have a good night at work. So Emily leaves and she says, call me if you need anything. So Jason says, make no mistake. I am super grateful for the opportunity to live here and the fact that people are still willing to take a chance on him. But it doesn't change the fact that he's still a man. And it's been three and a half years and it's time for him to make up for lost time and do something he hasn't done in a long time. So he's not feeling too guilty about it. So Jason calls Margarita. You can come on over. She's gone. Margarita says she's on her way. Jason says, I'm excited to see you and I'll see you when you get here. So the producer asks, Jason, are you worried that when you get caught that you will be asked to leave? Jason says he doesn't worry. Jason says that there's definitely an element of fear, but that makes it more exciting for him. He says if he has to, he'll just toss her out the window. <laughs> <laughs> he obviously didn't say it like that, but he said, if I have to, I'll tell Marguerite to go the hell out the window. I don't understand how the hell he got her to come over here. Don't quite understand it. Okay, we hear noises coming from the house. Good grief. I didn't need to hear all that. That is the end of this recap. Episode number six is coming right up. Anyway, guys. Thank you so much for watching my channel. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Bye.